If you enjoyed this show, then make sure you check out the other great shows on the Legion Podcast Network, like Cinema PsyOps, Cinema Beef, Devour the Podcast, Duncan and Bo Come Correct, Exploding Heads Horror Movie Podcast, Friday the 13th, Get Slayed, The Hell Mean Power Hour, Hello, This is the Doom Show, Hero Hero Go Show, Kill the Cast, Underwater Kaiju from Outer Space, Jerry Hates Action, Legion After Dark, Mental Health, Obsessive Cinema, Discourse, Pick 6 Movies, The Podcast by the Cemetery, The Podcast on Haunted Hill, The Psycho Semantic Podcast, Rick Radio, House of Wax, Dude Looks Like the 80s, Rabbit and Red Radio, The Shade Cast, Short Bus Cinema, Two Drink Minimum Commentaries, The VD Clinic, Who Will Survive Horror Podcast, and Witch vs. the Doomsday Clock. With such a widespread of shows, there is guaranteed to be a niche for you to fall in love with. Horror, politics, movies, books, sex, music, commentaries, health, video games, kaiju, action, news, comedy, and opinions that would most likely get you killed in some parts of the world. We are proud to bring you some of the best podcasting in the world. Check us out at www.legionpodcast.com, iTunes, Spotify, Stitcher, YouTube, and any other dark corner of the internet where podcasts can be found. I know Steve Spielberg is still very busy. I want his commentary. I want to. I know he's done the documentary. He's told about it. But you have the director watching it and talking about it as he's watching it. And, I, I mean, if we can't get his commentary, at least let's get uh, you know the sheriff's commentary. I, I'm uh, blanking on his name, but you know he's still around. Uh, he passed away. Are you sure? Mr. Schneider has passed away. Roy Schneider is who you're thinking of. Yeah. Yeah. He's he has passed away, Rich. When did he die? Welcome to Rabbit and Red's Hits and Misses. Looking back at over our two years of recorded shows and just our history, there's so many different spots to start at, and just even how the show was created, the quick backstory was, it was very simple, me calling Mike and telling him, hey, let's do a horror show within about an hour, half hour, we're on Blog Talk Radio, and did I think it was an hour long show or a half hour long show, we just did it about Friday 13th. And it's to see where it's gone from there all the way to what it is now. Whether that's better or for worse, that's pretty much up to every individual to decide on. I wanted to go over some of the earlier history of when we made that jump to horrorbid.com. And I can't sit here and lie and try to put on a face and say I hated it. There's a lot of great times with horrorbid.com. And I wanted to play this clip that's coming up here. This is when it was Justin, Mike, and myself. And when you listen to those shows, I think we hit maybe 13% horror, 14%. The rest was anything else. It usually evolved around Mike's life because that was just such an easy talking point to jump on when there wasn't enough horror news. And this one's from episode, it was the 22nd episode on Horror Big called Say What? And this was Justin, Mike, and myself talking about Mike's dating life and the website that he was on. Here you go. Well, I, I, I met her. How the hell did I meet her? Through MySpace, you moron. Oh, I, yeah. You know what well, I used? no, it wasn't MySpace. It was something else. It was uh, a GIMP dating service, wasn't oh, it? Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. 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 It, it was called... Um, it Literally? Was called, uh, yeah, it was. Yeah, through a GIMP dating, it was called something like special or no whispers for you <laughs> dot com. Yeah. and it had the handicap logo with yes. balloons coming from it <laughs> it's like a fat logo for me yeah <laughs> whispers for you yeah what's so the I whispers what's the i can't walk <laughs> yeah my life's miserable <laughs> my wants to be back full <laughs> my penis well, i don't do that but but on this on this site though I mean, people had, like, various... You know, some chicks were on there, and they said their disability was asthma. <laughs> I'm banging one of those girls. You, you ever have sex with a girl with an asthma problem? You think you're giving them orgasm, or just having an attack, but you don't care? You're like, eh, look at this chick go crazy. She's trying to reach for your inhaler. It's just, she's trying, trying to reach for an inhaler. It gets to the point where she dies. You walk away. You hope you didn't leave any evidence. <laughs> 
what you did. All over her lower back <laughs> and the back of her head. <laughs> yeah, so, so, so I start talking to this chick, and it's weird because she kind of looked like a guy, but like I said, she had a nice person. It wasn't a guy, though. But, you know, she had a nice personality. And she we looked would talk like Michael back J. with a toupee. No, I disagree with that statement. But she did. We, we started... We we started like talking back and forth, okay? And yo, and, uh, <laughs> and you, Mike. What? I'm so sorry. I'm I'm lost here because I don't know what the hell's going on. And, and Mike, there. I'm from the I'm from Wish, I'm from the Whisper site. <laughs> I can't hear you. No, actually, she did have cerebral palsy. She did oh. have it. But but here's the thing. But and see this is this is one of the reasons this is but wait, this is one of the reasons that I will never date a gimp ever again because of this. Um she she did you know, she didn't walk with, with canes, she did walk with a little bit of a limp. Uh there were pictures on her on her on her site of her holding a rifle, which should have um I swear to God, there were pictures on her on her site of her holding a rifle. She wasn't even really crippled. She just liked bang. <laughs> she had a fetish for a cripple. <laughs> That's just her. No, thing. dude. No, seriously. She, I know. Kills, I know what people kids. that have speech impediments that have cerebral palsy sounds like, and she definitely had cerebral palsy. Maybe she was just slow. Oh no, she was probably slow. What was her partially, IQ? Eighty-three. I don't know. <laughs> no, you're smarter than her, though, Mike. It was eighty-three. Yeah, by one point. Uh, I know what 12 times 18 is. Let's watch but, a movie. Oh, I got to camp but, out Nightmare 1 through 6. <laughs> that sounds great. I can't count that high. <laughs> Jesus, dude. So, so, so wait. So we would, like, talk, like, every day. And here's the thing. Like, in Illinois, there's the time difference from here. Like, we're on Eastern time here. And she'd be, like, an hour behind us or something so like she would call me and want to talk to me at like till like three in the morning and i would have and i was working at that point so i would have to get up for work well, sundowners <laughs> <laughs> what would you talk about what, what was some of the things you would talk about mike we would parking just, we would just no we, we would just talk we would talk about like anything, really. Like we'd be on, but she would want me to talk. Like God, I hate she, she would hate. <laughs> she would hate for me to like do anything else. Like she would want me to just work and then talk to her. Who like I would be fight? wanting to do like our Horlick thing, and I wouldn't even be able to do that without her wanting to text or talk or something else. You know. What's up with like, flights of stairs? <laughs> <laughs> Why does God hate us? <laughs> <laughs> what, she, what were you? Wait, what was she gonna do with that rifle? Was I don't she, know. Was she gonna, was When's she, Jerry Lewis gonna find our cure? <laughs> but then, but then it's like every other day she would like say that like her friends were dying, and it's like it's yeah, because she had a rifle. <laughs> well, no, she would say that That's like how they she died got of cancer. One one person she said got into a car accident or something was hit by a car and it was like a bloody mess and I'm like oh walk up to people Vince and go thinner <laughs> but <laughs> dude was she but, an old tipsy lady yeah no but then like so then I I, I stopped talking to her and I kind of just told her it was done you know. And and she would I would get calls from restricted numbers like this was like three years ago but like for like six months there I would get calls from restricted numbers she hacked into my old email account and what sent is... all my friends and sent all my friends these threatening emails Do you, threatening you know, to kill you know them what and hasn't shit. been done is like that? a is like a like a handicap horror movie and there's a reason for it because it would suck. <laughs> <laughs> oh no, there was one. It was called Campbell Nightmares. Yeah. <laughs> how how are you gonna beat? The, you know, it would be so easy. You just you run up a flight of stairs. <laughs> the guy can't get you anymore. <laughs> yeah, but you there's win. a difference. I'm not the killer in the film. Hey, so. I got a question, Mike. If one of Campbell Nightmares, you play a guy with a karate suit on. He yeah. doesn't have cerebral palsy, but you have cerebral palsy. How do you pull right. that off as an actor? I was uh, in a motorcycle accident. <laughs> <laughs> Like every other film <laughs> I ever did. 
Well, in 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 Dylan and Chris, the movie that I did where I had AIDS, I just made it like I was in a car accident. <laughs> it's always some kind of accident. Can't like one time you get. Well, no, and then I was in an accident and I had to get a blood transfusion, and that's how my character got AIDS. That's, he doesn't want to blame it on God. <laughs> no. Well, actually, in, in in Only Time Will Tell, I sent you those movies, Justin. Only Time Will Tell and A Precious Gift. I I blame it on God. Oh, you, well, you you should watch those. They're, they're really, good. I really am. I have to be around other people that. Well, no, actually, your your wife would probably enjoy those a little more because they are dramatic. Oh well, <laughs> you know, they're they're comedic. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm actually watching. I'm actually, and I I think I plug my other movies in. In both of those, at least. Yeah, oh, no, this, this is the so classic thing. You know how, like, say, Warner Brothers does a movie, and then in, in the movie there's another Warner Bros. But it just says, but in Mike's movies, he'll play his old movies, but yet he's in a scene, and yet on TV he's on the TV. <laughs> yeah, because so well, here's the thing: in only time will in only time will tell, and a precious gift. My character plays a writer. Okay, so in no person did. So in. So in one of the movies, in A Precious Gift, I think it is, I'm I'm watching one of my movies to try to get ideas to oh, write another movie. God. So I'm watching my Halloween disaster uh, that I made in '96. Here's what I, in here's what I should do. I gift. should I should learn. But you actually you actually made the real Halloween six. Is that what you just said? No, I made a movie. I actually made a movie in 1996. I made it. I started writing it uh, yeah, the Monday a, after made, I saw Halloween six in the theaters. You made a Halloween disaster. Yeah, you have it. It's horrible. Yeah. Called, watch it with Halloween. the commentary because it's, it's the only uh, way to watch it's always it. good to do a Halloween movie when you have the shittiest Halloween mask of all time the shittiest Myers mask <laughs> and you have a guy wearing a typo and negative t-shirt and shorts <laughs> I, I well that's because I told you it was I, a disaster it turned out you know, one thing one thing that can be in the movie is the uh, the white trash above ground pool and camp yeah, that has Nightmare, to be in the, the movie the that really ha- hey Maybe just the cameo. Is the chlorine going to kill the killer in the uh, new one? <laughs> He's allergic to killing. Don't ruin the ending. No, that'll that that that'll be addressed in the sequel. Uh, no, I, I wouldn't even talk oh, about God. chlorine killing the killer. That's horrible. No, I wouldn't. Uh, it turns out chlorine kills them. Then why wouldn't people just keep chlorine around their house and throw it on them? Well, because nobody else knows that. That's why. <laughs> yeah, not even the people in the movie. <laughs> people in the right. movie didn't even. Well, do... I knew it. If even dude, the killer. watch. Justin, watch Thorn Goes to Hell. You have that. That's where there's the one scene in there where I go into Thorn's bedroom and I find Thorne's a certificate bedroom. that says he's allergic to chemical water. Certificate? Well, they give me a certificate shit. for that? <laughs> You're allergic to peanuts. Yeah, it, was just, uh, it was just a piece of notebook paper that I that I wrote on something. And, Did you know what you know. I'm doing with Mike's movies right now? we got to prop it up one into the couch. What the fuck? <laughs> uh, <laughs> He sent me a stack of movies. I mean, this kid's got a library of movies. Like, it's it's. it's I made 30 plus in the last. Oh, you know what? Mike, Mike shouldn't have a budget to make films. Mike should pay people, so he so he's allowed to do films. You, Surprisingly, I don't have to. People just want to get involved. Uh, for the we're most we're part. teasing with you. Camp Out Nightmare is gonna be huge. I, really? Yeah, it's gonna be it's gonna be very huge. Uh, is... Three fat people already signed up for the roles. <laughs> <laughs> This next one coming up is from the 25th show on Horror Bid. And what I loved about this was the opening segment on the show where we covered, you know, Sleepaway Camp would be remade. But what I loved more about it, there's two big things in this segment that stick out. One, how Mike and I talk about our lack of preparation for each show, him getting guests, how that works with him and I and scheduling. But what I really still love on this one is that we all knew that Mike was the biggest Donald Pleasance fan ever. He could cite any of the characters of Dr. Loomis's lines. And what I wanted to do was really showcase that and show everybody that it's not a, just a gimmick. It's it's not he's not a character. This is this is who he is. So on this clip you're going to hear Mike while I overdub the music hear him recite from the original Halloween the Dr. Loomis talking about the devil's eyes here it goes this is from February of 2011 
Welcome here Welcome to Rabbit, Rabbit and Red Radio. I am it's Paul joined as always with my wife, my lover, my best friend, well, uh, Michael J. I wouldn't go as far as saying wife. That that kinda might scare people. I wouldn't go as far as saying best friend either well, when I went there. Women, you know. Uh, and I did see I'll, yesterday and you know I eat some stuff, but I'm you know <laughs> it was it's cookies and cream and they put like whipped cream and a cherry on it and it's oh Oh, so good, but I regret it afterwards every time. When I used to eat heavily years ago, <laughs> yeah. I'd feel the... You know, I guess when uh, when people have a one-night stand and then they regret it afterwards, like, oh, why did I do that? That's how I used to feel when I would go to McDonald's, uh-huh. order... Uh, I would get three Big Macs, two large fries, and a, and a, and a, and a uh, super-sized Ooh. soda when they had it. Uh-huh. And uh, then afterwards, I would just feel so ashamed of myself. Like, what are you doing, you big whore? Like, what's wrong? I would just feel like a fat whore. I really would. Do you, uh, just, uh, do you think that you are the, the price, reason yeah. that they did away with Super Size? I mean, you're developed, uh, you know, now. But, you know, do you think that... No. Uh, I, I never thought they should have got rid of it and just, like, they're getting rid of uh, Ronald McDonald. You don't want to get in a whole... What is the deal? For, it's political. I don't want to get in political. It's not a political show. You come here to forget about stupid politics. Okay. Both sides suck. You know that. Right. But uh, that's the, oh, they're teaching kids. Just like Joe Camel. Look, I started smoking when I was 18, and it wasn't Camels. Okay? It, it, I smoked the cheapest brand possible because I, I would have to go to the gas station that, would, uh, that wouldn't card me. Because... Uh, here and there, I smoked when I was seventeen, but it really picked up when I was eighteen. Right. I just I don't get into that. I don't I don't understand it. The whole uh, oh that's the reason. People go to fast food because it tastes good. Yeah. A lot of and here's the other thing. Why don't you start taking responsibility? Because a lot of a lot of parents are too lazy to cook, or they ha- they don't have enough time to cook. Who has time? That's why. But it's not Ronald McDonald. Kids don't go there. Sit with the toys. It, you go go to Toys R Us, get a toy. Yeah, but when I was a kid, you know, I was kind of attracted. You know, Ronald McDonald did kind of help get me in the door. I mean, he was a clown. Uh, I'm scared <laughs> of clowns since, but... What, what, what did Ronald do? I mean... I don't know. It was that yeah. red hair, I think, and the, the yellow... The yellow the costume smile. or whatever he wore. It made me think of, like, a French fry with white paint on it. Does that mean... So... So Ronald's gone. Does that mean Grimace is gone? They're without a job. Oh, the hamburger girl. Grimace hamburger is amazing. That big purple thing. What's the hamburger going to do? Uh, What's Mayor McCheese going to do? Yeah, but you know what? He's they're probably run. gone too. <laughs> I think they've been gone. That's. You know, I remember as a kid, Wendy's just sucked as a kid because they wouldn't. Wendy sucked. It's like, ah, God, what's with a square cheeseburger? Who wants that stuff? <laughs> well, you know, it was square, and you know they say squares are boring and. That's what they were trying to do, I guess. I don't know. Yeah, there's there's always something with me. I just, I, I don't get it. Don't take away Ronald. Come on. It's, it's ridiculous. Are, are you going to replace him, Elise? Can, can they, are they going to replace him with an asparagus <laughs> guy? You know. You, you know what I saw the other day? They, I was flipping through, and they had that one episode. Uh, was it of The Simpsons? Where they have the thing where, uh, oh, it was on some animated thing where, uh, you know, it rips on the JFK thing where uh, they shoot Mayor McCheese or something. Was that oh, the yeah. <laughs> that was The Simpsons. Yeah. Anytime they're ripping JFK, it's The Simpsons. Yeah. Come on, Mayor Quimby. That's why I love it. <laughs> <laughs> Mayor McCheese. Uh. I mean, come on. That's a great name. Yeah. You can't and get and it's those. shot and, and the Jackie Kennedy is like eating. <laughs> <laughs> Do you remember that? Yeah. <laughs> that was enjoyable. I like that. Yeah, when I... Um, when I want to try to get away from the regular news, I go to uh, horror bid, and uh, after I get through the hate mail, I like to read the forums. And um, <laughs> now there's one. Uh, I, I think uh, we're gonna call him the unofficial uh, writer of a show of, of Rabbit and Red, um, Miles X X Thirteen X, because mm-hmm. he, he comes up with unintentionally Is good that stuff. His name? For us I always thought it was. I thought it was like Miles X Thirteen or something. I, I yeah. You know. No, I just said Miles. At Miles X 13X. Ah, okay, there's the extra yeah. X in there. Okay, I get it. Yeah. And um, it's about Sleepaway Camp. And we're going to get into um, the 64, the round six of voting to get into the final 64, but because uh, Sleepaway Camp is part of that. Right. So um, 
He said, I, re- I rarely hear anything about Sleepaway Camp on here, meaning the forum site of horrorbit.com. Mm. Is it because you guys aren't big fans of it? Question mark. Has it been forgotten? I thought the first three made a, made a pretty nice little trilogy. I agree. Mm-hmm. It was a nice little package. I'm, I'm not the biggest fan of two and three. I thought they went into a different aspect, and that's what he talks about. Uh, he talks about how, you know, want to, want more for a comedic kind of feel. Right. But it's uh, Sleepaway Camp, the original. I don't. I feel it doesn't get a, enough recognition. Sometimes it came out during the '80s when you had a lot of films coming out during the '80s. But I think it was an edge above. What was what could be forgotten that came out in the eighties? I thought Sleepaway Camp was just there enough to you remember that when you think of Sleepaway Camp, the original, you think of the eighties horror genre. Right. I think that I think that's fair to say. I would agree with you. And I think he makes a good point. It's it's the, what the first one was. Uh, that was one of those. I want to see a documentary on on the Sleepaway Camp. Well, you know, you might want to talk to the guy, um, Jeff Hayes, who runs uh, Sleepaway Camp Movies, who is also involved with um, Return to Sleepaway Camp. It seems like he is, uh, you know, and I'm trying to track him down now to see maybe we can talk to him, but he seems like the type of guy who is really like the, um, um, what's the word I'm looking for here, Vince? Um, Handsome? Well, uh, he could be that. Well, he could be that, but I'm... (laughs) I, I'm I'm saying uh, is he the is he the main guy? Well, I, when it comes yeah, to I, I think that camp. when it comes to sleepaway camp, I think he knows his stuff pretty much. See, that's that's a, not only here's a point, and it's just it dawned on me right now. When you think of Halloween, you think of John Carpenter, you think of Nightmare on Elm Street. I think of Wes Craven. I think about the people who created it. Now with sleepaway camp, maybe this is why it has been forgotten. Right. The director didn't really. I don't have I don't have his resume in front of me. I but, get that for you. But usually, and, and if you can, please. I, I'm um, getting it now. Like Joseph Zito with Friday the 13th Part 4. I think of that in The Prowler, you know, as, as a Zito film. And that's what, with Sleepaway Camp, you don't think of the director. So you have the film, but usually with a film, you think of the director or a star and how they went on to do other stuff, and that's how you can still remember Sleepaway Camp. And that's what I feel it's it's missing. I don't know offhand who has the major distribution rights, all that other stuff. It, it's all, um, it's all. I mean, see, that's that's where we have the thing now. I think uh, Anchor Bay owns one through three, and uh, Magnet Releasing is now on board for uh, you know the fourth one. You know, Return to Sleepaway Camp, and probably most likely uh, Sleepaway Camp Reunion, which I'll also look that up. But I believe it's filming now. I think I said this before. I, I would like to see Sleepaway Camp be remade. Yeah, I mean it's gonna it's gonna happen. It will happen. But, I just don't know when. But, but I think it will. An, I think that's okay to be remade because it will introduce. Because uh, I don't see. I don't know. W- look, when we were young and and the Fly came out, we were really young. Right. But I mean, for a long time, I'm sure I knew. I I knew it. I didn't know at the time that that was a remake. It was only couple years after. Yeah, I didn't But either. today, yeah, today with technology, just go on the internet and I'm sure you can find out, oh, that's a remake. So let me, I would personally, I want to see the original. That's what I did with True Grit. I saw the original years ago. Right. But I rewatched the original to get ready to see the remake. Huh. You know, and I wonder if that, if because they say, oh, it, it reintroduced it. I don't know if a lot of people will know it's a remake. Mm-hmm. If it comes out. I'm sure that happened with Prom Night because that was geared towards uh, teenagers, young teenagers. I uh, I do agree with you, and, and I I'm, do have Robert Hiltzik's uh, Hiltzik's uh, filmography up. Uh, right now we have. Return. What is he known for? Well, this is on IMDb. So what what they always show what he's what he's known. This for. is well, this is actually IMDb Pro, so it's kind of a step up oh. from that because it okay, gives me well, a little more information. Um, I'm very sorry. Well, we're, uh, we're not up to your level. Well, you know, uh, right show now. Off. Right now, we, we have uh, Return to Sleepaway Camp, it, and then it says Return to Sleepaway Camp behind the scenes, which I guess was a bonus feature on the disc, I don't know. Uh, yeah. Grandma's Secret Recipe, which is a short film. Okay. Now, here's the thing. That Sleepaway Camp for the Survivor Yeah. that was on the Sleepaway Camp box set, he's credited as, uh, well, 
the characters were characters based on uh, what he did. So I really yeah, want to so see that original. footage. I haven't seen it. Uh, and then Sleepaway Camp 3 is writer characters. Sleepaway Camp 2 is writer characters. Well, just Sleepaway one under as it. a director. Yeah. Sleepaway oh, that's Camp. it. It was that's it. Okay, so and now uh, Grandma's Camp Reunion. Oh, uh, well, Grandma's Secret Recipe Actually, was Actually, he was in that. I don't think he... Yeah, oh. he was in that. He didn't direct it. Or okay, well, that's what I meant. When uh, you think of Halloween, you think of John Carpenter. Um, unfortunately, you know, uh, he didn't go on to do any other films. You know, anything else. Because, say, if he did another horror movie and it was pretty good, then you go, oh, okay, yeah, because that guy did these two films. That's kind of the way I associate it. I'm not saying that's how everybody should associate it. It's just the way that I look at things. I look at it that way. Right. And I had Sleepaway Camp on the round six uh, to the road to 64. Um, you had to vote. You had eight choices, 17, uh, to choose from. I have to tell you, just like the other poll, I put certain movies up because I think it's fair. Right. I'm, I, I'm trying my damnest. I'm having help. Because uh, I, I don't want to miss a film, mm -hmm. but I think all the major ones are they're in there. Right. Because if somebody complains, it goes, "Dude, you didn't put Choppy Mall. Man, Choppy Mall could have won. Shut up." Yeah, but you love Choppy Mall yourself. I do love Choppy Mall, but it's not going to win. <laughs> okay, that's my point. So say if I did miss Choppy Mall, I think it's okay. <laughs> I, wow. I think it's all right. Um, so I, I put up uh, House of Wax from 2005. I could not put up the, and I stated it, I could not put up the original House of Wax because it's only from films made from 1960 to um, 2010. Right. You know, at least the film has to be out for a year so some, you know, people have seen it. Mm -hmm. So um, so House of Wax, 2005, no, last I checked, no votes, and I'm loving it. That's I love that. <laughs> Doesn't deserve votes. Well, I, I've so, never, a, I didn't see the House of Wax remake, so I, I don't know. You're busy uh, watching a lot of uh, Camp on Nightmare Six. Do you, when you watch your old films, right? Um, I used to do this, um, and this, and this is what drove me nuts and made me not like doing comedy for a long time. Because uh -huh. I, I guess I'm always going to be an athlete to an extent because I love sports. Right. I would watch my stand-up sets, and I would sit there with a notepad and critique myself. <laughs> I'm serious. I would critique myself going, okay, don't move, Dorn, when you're telling this joke. But this, it's like studying a, a defense right. uh, with defensive coordinator going, okay, you're going to move to the side on the 4 3 defense when they're doing the wishbone option. Yeah. And do you do that when you're watching Camp Out Nightmare 6? Do you go, okay, I, I have to, when you watch any of your films, do you say to yourself when you're watching it, you have a notepad and go, all right, I should have cut there. I should next time position the camera this way. Uh, well, Actually, I don't. I mean, I should, but I, I, I guess, I mean, I do, I do critique myself. Don't get me wrong. I do do that. Um, but I don't uh, sit there with a, a pad and paper saying, okay, this, there, that. No, I just sit there and I say, dude, you're an idiot. Why, why did you even do that? Well, really? I, I, it's, uh, it, it could be worse like the time I tried critiquing your film, but I would just keep making pots of coffee and dumping it on your head and, and say, and screaming at you, you need to do better. <laughs> Don't make me do this. I love you. Why are you making me do this? And I would keep punching you. Well, I, I think he got the message, though. Uh, I'm hoping with the upcoming <laughs> film that uh, we're not going to have the same problem. Uh, or, you know. I, but so I far, the, bud uh, the budget should be coming in soon. Uh, Mike and I are going to cash in our uh, loose change. Yeah. And uh, I, I'm thinking that we're going to get about a, a half a case of uh, ketchup. And, uh, oh, we're in trouble. <laughs> What if that? Uh, I want to see a documentary with that. You know, just make a, at a loose change and you can make a film. Uh, well, what do you want to call I'm a sure documentary? Loose change in the making of Camp Out Night. Well, you don't want to use the title loose change. I'm going to use that for a uh, political documentary. So, right, right. Um, <laughs> um, uh, a ten cent film. Uh, ten cent film. Yeah. Um, that. You know, with uh, Patrick Farmer's doing the Horror Hut, maybe we could uh, do a spin-off. I'm sure that's going to be successful. We'll do a spin-off in the the, uh, the quarter theater. <laughs> you know, you know, have you have the quarter booths at an adult novelty shop. You right. go in there. It's discreet. I'm sure it's probably five bucks now. Mike, how much is it? You go to those places. You I those. have not a clue. <laughs> you know, I, I want to do probably uh, about a dollar by now, though. I think some take uh, credit cards. I wouldn't be surprised. But see, well, how does that work? Like, you, you go in and you put a quarter, and then you have, like, maybe, what, uh, 30 seconds? 
I don't know. And, and God bless the gentleman who could uh, do that. Mm -hmm. What he has to do in 30 seconds. I mean, at that point, it, that's not enjoyable. Isn't that just work? It becomes a chore. You ever get to that point in your life where, where it's around 6 p.m. at night and you're going, oh, what am I, oh I forgot to masturbate today. Ah, oh, that's what I needed to do. That's when uh, that's when the priorities are getting a little out of whack when that masturbation comes on your priority list. Wow. I speak from from experience, folks, because <laughs> it wasn't that long ago in life where that was a priority for me. Who wants a body massage? Uh, I'll admit to that. That's different. That's that's being that's being lonely. Uh, I uh, you know I don't disagree now, with that statement. Now look at me. I have a lot going on, and and yet I'm doing this. Back when I was lonely. I, I had nothing going on. This is what I should have been doing. Wow. I should be. I should have been doing this. No, now it's the opposite of. Hey, let, let me see what else I could do. Well, yeah. And I know uh, Mike and I talked uh, yesterday. Um, we did. And uh, we were talking about. Uh, Mike gets frustrated at times. I don't. I don't know. Mike. This is what happens. This is some. Um, off-air stuff. Mike will yeah. yell at me out of nowhere. And this is what I mean like when I say he's my wife. Yeah. Because it's like being in a marriage. And out of nowhere, I'll just yell and it'll say... And it's really negative stuff sometimes. And it happens. Sometimes, yes. And I get upset because it's you. And I can't... I can't... What am I going to do? What am I gonna you do? can punch me in the I, face. I can't do that. What if I what said I would allow it? I, that, that's not fun. <clears throat> that's not fun. That's... I could have... Look, I don't... I don't ever... <laughs> I would never, I would never yell in the face of a woman, let alone slap around a handicapped person. I'm sorry. Okay. That's just I don't do that. Well. I don't have the time. <laughs> but Mike, Mike had we had a heart to heart and we talked and uh, Mike said and I understood this. You know, Mike has uh, Mike. Why don't you tell it? You you tell it better. I'm it's, not it's, good it's at you. telling people. Uh, fine, I'll I'll say it. Mike, of course, he has cerebral palsy. We all know that. Yeah. yeah. And um, he he, what I think Mike wants to do, and I I don't see it being that difficult at first. But then what Mike's explaining, yeah, it is difficult. It's very uh, difficult. Mike would like to meet women. I'm, <laughs> when I say meet women, it not, doesn't mean I want to have sex with. I just want to meet a girl and have sex with her. No, yeah. he would like you know to have somebody to talk to, a, a friend, female friends. I, I have male friends. I have plenty of male friends. He does, and you know, I I knew this was coming uh, coming to a, a point that Mike would need to talk to a lady when he would ask me to come over his place and bring a dress and uh, a wig. Well, I I didn't under and you know he would say, oh don't worry, we're filming a scene and, and there would be no camera, and then he would yeah. just tell me about his life. Well, yeah, well I I could put the camera in the ceiling, but you know. Well, that's for I have the draw. You you you've seen the ceiling in my bedroom. It has like <laughs> little styrofoam tile things. I could just. Move that and pretend like I was putting a camera in there, but there really wouldn't be a camera there. So, <laughs> well, again, Mike with the voyeuristics bringing it to the show. Well, the, but Mike, I, I made this promise to Mike. I said, Mike, I guarantee you, if we throw it out there, uh -huh. you put out your Facebook thing. Right. I guarantee it. The lovely ladies of HorrorBid.com would love to talk to you and really love to get to know you. Right. I'm not talking into uh, this is for dating only. This is for this. No, just just to talk to Mike because I guarantee Mike is. If I had Mike's heart, I think I'm a I'm a good-hearted person. But Mike is. If I was half the man as Mike, I would really be getting. I would be doing really well for myself. And that's what I want. I want Mike to. I want you ladies. To see what Mike has to offer, mm. he he does have a lot to offer, and he's a great guy. Right. And I think it's possible. I think you are gonna. I I, I predict that you're gonna meet somebody. I think you're gonna meet your future wife doing this. I'm serious. I mean that. Well, see, remember we did talk yesterday, and I did tell you that. Uh, <clears throat> I I don't think any, anybody's gonna uh, go for this. I really don't. It's not. It's not a radio bit. It's not some stupid contest. This is right. real life. Because right. look, you, you go on that that plenty of fish. Which, by the way, plenty of fish. It, all that really is is, hey, do you want, are you down to fuck? That's what it should be called. Are you down well, to fuck? I, I will say this: it is cheaper than eHarmony. I did that for a month for fifty bucks, and that was a waste. Well, aren't the, That's aren't a big the waste. aren't the questions at eHarmony uh, religiously biased? Uh, I don't know because it's been a few years since I've since I've done it. But. I heard about that, and it, why don't you sign up for uh, J Date? You know, I think uh, you can be non-Jewish and go on J-Date. 
No, I think you have to be Jewish to go on J date. Well, that's discriminatory. What if well, a guy likes uh, What if he has a thing for Jewish ladies? He goes, ah, eh, well, I want to. I want to convert. See, and I remember, you know, you suggested to me yesterday. You're like, well, why don't you give whispers for you another try? And I said, and I meant that. Yeah, but uh, because of past experience, uh, and I did get a call from a restricted number again the other night. So I'm I kill you. Yeah, so I don't think I'm going to go back down that road again. I did go on uh, whispersforyou.com uh, dot com after talking about it, and uh, when I just I didn't sign up or anything, uh, be, but you can see some of the profiles. And you know, hey, there's people. Uh, I'm uh, I'm I'm paralyzed from from the waist down. Right. Uh, I have cerebral palsy. You know, these are dis people with disabilities. Very tough to meet somebody. But then there's people, and this is a cop out. This is a violation to, to the extent, but a huge cop out nonetheless of saying. I have asthma. Mm -hmm. uh, what? Yeah. You have asthma? Actually, Come you know what? I, I forgot to mention this, but the first person back before the, the psychotic uh, gimp, um, years before that, I the first time I ever went on Whispers for You, I uh, had this, this, this girl from, she said she was uh, from uh, California or something, and she wanted to talk. So we would talk, and we were going back and forth, and it was great. And she's like, okay, um, I'm I'm going to be moving out to Philly soon so we can, you know, get together and meet. So I said, you know, fine. So she's like, uh, but would it be possible and I'll repay you? Uh, can I have $500 to pay my phone bill? Wow. And what and was her disability besides being she broke? Said she, she said she had asthma. Wow. Uh... <laughs> Oh, 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 what the? That, that's that's one of those traps, and I, I I would never do right, one. Which no, I, I didn't. Uh, I pretty much deleted my Yahoo Messenger account after that because that's what we talked through, and uh, I'm just glad I never gave her my phone number. Uh yeah, I just need uh five hundred dollars to uh, pay my phone bill. Um, who are you talking to? I thought I thought we had a thing here. I want you to explain that. <laughs> Well, the, uh, you, yeah, but uh, that was that was before I even met you. That was before you. What before me? Or are we yeah, going out? Yeah, before you. <laughs> I I don't get the whole. I I know that's one of the traps of online online dating is um, a lot of people go out for scams. They go, right. oh, I have this, uh, I have a sick kid. Not that uh, I would never try that, and I'm sure I probably could. I could just show a photo of Mike and I and say, ah, that's my sick brother, Milton, and uh, <laughs> I need a $1,000. Uh, 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 uh. Okay, I, I just think you're disabled, not uh, not mentally challenged. Yeah, well, so, yeah, but the thing is... for bite for, your tongue? Yeah, but with the name Milton, <laughs> you know, I mean, come on. that That has to be really special. Well, uh, what about uh, what about uh, Michael J? That sounds special enough. That's definitely special enough. That's what I. I, I that's why I, I I don't I don't know the plenty of fish. I, I don't I'm not a big fan of that. I don't think that's good for you. <clears throat> I think har I, I'm gonna change harbid dot com. There's there should be a dating section on harbid dot com. There should be a social network. Section seriously on harbid.com. Social sure. networking for harbid.com. What you know? What else? Have horror fans and other horror fans talk to each other? Yeah, they're not. Time. They're not taking our uh, our spot away on the green bar at the top of the page though for it. We'll sponsor it. Okay. It'll be under us. Rabbit and Red presents Harbid Social Network. Screams for you. How about that? Screams for you. Hey. Total that's opposite. A little better. I I I I may be for that. Shouts for love. Shouts for love. Uh, I think uh, bloody for you. There, there you go, and uh, I'm sure we'll Flashers get a lot. Flashers for you. <clears throat> See, there would be. Uh, I, I think there that that could that could possibly work. You know, uh, you have it has to be censored because you do it no censorship. Then uh, after one day, you'll see like 16 dick pics on there. <laughs> yeah, you don't want that. <laughs> no, that's nobody wants that. Yeah, it's not good women don't even want that. I could agree with you. Sending a uh, a woman a picture of your penis is the equivalent of uh, giving a homeless man a picture of a menu. Wow. It's going to do nothing for them. You're going, okay, that's great. I'd rather have the real thing. Right. Wow, a picture of spaghetti. Thank you. That really huh. helps. Well, some people, you know, especially people that enjoy food, you know, that, that might do something for them. You never know. Well, I want to do something for you. Uh, before we go to break... 
I want to. Oh, uh, let me guess. In the break, you're you're going to play uh, Katy Perry for me. Uh, probably not. Ah. Um, I don't think that's going to happen anytime soon. Oh, that's disappointing. Uh, I I have been with the with the rounds of the sixty four. Yeah. The lead up. There are certain movies I I put back in for a second chance. Right. Um, Halloween six did not fare too well on the early voting. I thought didn't uh, fare well enough even right. to get a second chance, but. I think there is a chance Halloween 6 is going to get in there because there's going to be, well, by the time the show comes up, it'll be up there. Right. I'm going to make a, a sequel round. Sequel round? I thought about this. Okay. I'm going to put in there, uh, Friday 13th Part 4 is going to make it. Friday 13th Part 2 is going to make it. Right. I'm going to have, what I would like to do is take 10 films. 10, 10. 10 Halloween sequels is what you're saying. So much sequels and remakes, kind of mi mix them up. But ten, you there's only gonna be one vote. Okay. I think it's fair. Okay. Yeah. I mean, I could see that. Yeah, that does seem fair. Because, for instance, Halloween 2007, Halloween 2 2009, Halloween 6. Ah, uh, Halloween 2 2009. I would be all over that. But I can only pick one. Exactly. See. Ah, uh, you, you bastard. Well, here's the reason. I can't have. I, I want the round of '64 to be great films. There's a reason that they're in there. They had to get through the big voting rounds to make it in there. So you know they're going to garnish some vote. It's going to be competition. Mm -hmm. And I, I'm not trying to do this to make it so tough for people. I'm glad people are participating. Right. Because this is supposed to be fun. It is. And I, I'm still. I don't. Well, part I don't know of, if it's that fun because the choices are just too. Oh. You know. Well, it's it's prep. It's preparing you for what's going to happen. I mean, once you get down to say, God, God only knows what the what the elite eight is going to look like when those mm -hmm. top eight films are there. Right. That's going to be pretty tough because you know there's going to come to a point. Uh, you could say say the final two comes down to. Uh, do you think how? I would love to see, mm -hmm. and I believe I placed it correctly. So this this could happen. Okay. I really I I kind of I. I don't mess with the votes, but I kind of I wanted to see if this could happen and who would win. There's a reason why on the left part of the bracket, Halloween is the number one seed, and then going to be on the right side of the bracket. Meaning they're not going to these two films are not going to face each other unless they make it to the championship. On the right side of the bracket is definitely going to be Evil Dead will be a number three seed. Okay, that is a fact right now. That's I want that's a number three seed. That's definite. Yeah, because all the votes it got it, amazing. Okay. I would love to see what would happen. Who would win if Halloween from 1978 goes up against Evil Dead in Halloween. a championship? I see. I don't know. Now here's the thing with horror bid. Mm. I can I can just kind of if I can just read the meter a little bit. You have it'll be Halloween. You have a lot of Halloween fans on horrorbid.com, but you also have a lot of Evil Dead fans. Well, you have fans of both, but I think. Um, but, and, and don't get me wrong, I love Evil Dead, but I think that Halloween will just win out. You know, that's what I would think, but at the same time, both fans are very passionate, and they love them. They love each movie, right? And they extremely love it. So that would be really interesting to see. I'm not saying that would be the best matchup, mm -hmm. but I would be very curious. Oh. oh, and also before we go to break, did you want to answer the questions? That I would were given actually. To us, or do you want to I, give those later? I would like to answer those questions. Okay. Uh, well, the one question, um, I believe. Well, wait. The, the one question was for you. Okay. Uh, which was tougher? Uh, the, you know, from Billy, from Billy D about the, which was tougher, uh, the whole uh, cancer thing or working with Alex? Ah, uh, wow. Um, well, the the not knowing is is really, and that's why I didn't bring it up on the show. I, I talked about that with Mike. I was, and I, I didn't. Mike never really knew anything. No, he didn't tell me. So and I was I, in the dark like the rest of you. And I don't want to tell anybody because I don't. I think it takes away from the show. I don't look for sympathy. And uh, it wasn't. And with Alex, it, you know, I, I, I admit I do say some. I probably said some really awful things. I had a lot of anger built up because Mike, you know this. Mike wanted it. <laughs> Mike, did did you not want to get rid of him the first time? Uh, he, when there was issues to, with him the first time, I did say. Um, uh, and he was gone, uh, you know, 
uh, you wanted to bring him back. And I said, well, if you bring him back, uh, the same thing will happen again. And you said, uh, well, I, I really think that we should give him another shot. And I said, okay, uh, then if that's what you feel, if you feel you want to do that, then go ahead. But as we all know, things started happening again. So. And I tried again. And, you know, with I, I, I honestly, I have, I, the anger's gone. I just didn't like how it ended. I I don't wish anything wrong, uh, any harm to Alex. I really don't. I, I don't wish death on him. That's right. that's honest. Um, you know, I, I say things. I get sometimes I'm too quick mm -hmm. for my own good, and I'll just say things without without thinking. Right. I, and I even tried to call him myself and text him, and I didn't get a response. You know, I tried to reach out, but I didn't get anything. So I tried to, and there's nothing. And you know what? God bless him. I, I still feel guilty it didn't work. I, that's my responsibility. That was my responsibility. It should have worked. Um, but I have no hard feelings. I think what was tougher, uh, not knowing. <laughs> not right. knowing what the hell's And you, you keep feeling the lump. And I never went to any of the websites to find any symptoms because that's going to drive you even crazier. Is If you go to the doctors first, that's all that matters. But I think go to the doctors first, no matter what it is. Because once you start looking up online... You you create a whole world for yourself going, oh, my God, I, I think I got lupus. <laughs> yeah. Lupus? That's something House could diagnose. We're going to send you there. Well, I, I think a, a school nurse can diagnose lupus. I don't even know what lupus is. It just sounds like a weird, it sounds like a loop, you know, because it says lupus. It sounds like you're in like a loop or something. It's it's a, it's a common. Oh. <laughs> Actually, I don't think. Did not... you say it's a comet? No, no, it's it's not oh. it's not that you know. Oh. It's, I'll use a whooping cough. How about that? Uh, no, but that was definitely the toughest uh, of just not knowing and trying to. So I don't know. How do I? Explain? I try keeping everything together. I did a good. I can I can lose my mind. I can lose it into the place where I can I cannot think about something. Right. And my job is to try to put out the best product every single time. That's that's what I try to do, and I really mean that because I Mike knows that I'm a perfectionist i try my hardest and um because I, I care i i want i want to have fun and i want people to listen and go oh that's like okay these i get it these guys are they're cool that's that's all right and we're making as zero dollars and zero cents an hour right um yes true um and then the other question from uh, billy d was for me um, asking me uh which um, Halloween film do I think Donald did his best work in, excluding Halloween 78? And I believe he said that I can't say Halloween uh, 6 either. Very so, nice. Of course you love it. I, I, um, that's, well, I'm glad he threw in the not saying Halloween 6. Yeah, he listens to the show. Yes, and I'm sure Billy loves it because, you know, that just put me um, over the top. Because I, you know... For the longest time, you know, after I read that question, I debated it in my head, and I kept going back and forth, back and forth. What am I going to do? Um, I excluded five altogether. <laughs> I mean, Grant, I, I mean, I, I can't say that I that I that I outright hate it because Donald was in it, and he is one of the few things that made that movie bearable for me. Uh, but so, uh, yesterday so that, I went back and I watched two and four. That's two why you were again. watching two and four. Yeah, that. because I'm trying to decide between those two. Oh, that's easy. <laughs> it's it's a damn tough decision. That's not tough. Yes, it is. Oh, <laughs> um, come on. And as much as I feel like I'm going to hate myself in the morning for this, uh, <laughs> I mean, Billy, you don't understand the the immense pressure you put on me with the question. Hey, he, um, is, he is our number one Negro fan, as he states. Yes. Um, um, yeah. I'm going to have to say that, that I think, all in all, Halloween 2 was probably better. I agree. That's what you should say. Look, he did great in 4, but Halloween 2, that's... Come on. Yeah, but you know what sold it for me, and, and you're probably going to think I'm nuts. Sam Haynes' um, speech? That's, that's where yeah, you got to go. Actually, yeah, that, that's what I think I sold agree. it for me. Because, I agree. you know, it reflected back so much on the whole, um, you know, his monologue from the original when he's at Bracket. And he says about how, you know, I met him 15 years ago, and I was told there was nothing left. No reason, 
no conscience, no understanding, and even the most rudimentary sense of life or death, good or evil, right or wrong. I met this six-year-old child with this blank, pale, emotionless face and the blackest eyes, the devil's eyes. I spent eight years trying to reach him and another seven trying to keep him locked up because I realized that what was living behind that boy's eyes was purely and simply evil. What do we do? He's been here once tonight. I think he'll come back. I'm going to wait for him. <sighs> I can't and just... now he's going to cry at that. Oh, <sighs> God, I'm starting it. All right, I got to relax. Cause, there you go, you relax. Know. And then uh, uh, the last question, I guess, was for both of us uh, from Jamie Love, uh, also a regular listener, I would believe. Uh, yeah. She uh, asked, how long do we prep before each show? Um, I want everybody to look at their watches for yeah. three seconds, and there's your answer. <laughs> uh, <laughs> it, well, it's it's well, a two yeah. it's a two parter. It, this is how it works with with the guest. That's yeah. different. That's a lot of uh, that could be a good week to yeah. help. Some, hum- well, it all it all depends. depends. Cause with with guests, there's there's times with guests that I literally find out. Less One day. than 24 hours. Sometimes yeah. it's even less than 24 hours, depending on who it is. And, I mean, I know, like, there's people now that are, like, you contact them and they say they're interested, but then it's going back and forth trying to figure out a time when they're able to come on, you know. So That's a whole different story. That's a different animal. But the show itself, right. I, I mean... And don't when we say really no time doesn't mean we don't care about the show. That's that's complete bullshit. Right. Uh, we care about the show, but Mike and I can communicate well enough where right before we go on we say, okay, here's what we'll. Uh, did you see this on the site? We'll say, okay, yeah, I did. Okay, we'll hit that, this, and um, I'll throw anything out, and he's able to handle that. I'm able to handle what he throws at me. So there's times I, I wish I could. Uh, if I really, if I did so much superstructure to the show, it right. wouldn't be fun. It would, it just, you know, it becomes be like, uh, yeah, it's uh, like preparing for uh, a test. Right. You don't want to. I, I never uh, liked tests to begin with. So that's because the questions were tough. Like, what's three times three? Yeah, I or, uh, for the longest time I thought it was six until I learned that addition is not multiplication. So. Yeah, you just you were seeing a cockeyed. You thought the uh, X was a plus. Yeah, it happens. It happens to the uh, dumb of us. <laughs> True. Well, we'll <laughs> we'll be right back after this. You're listening to Rabbit in Red Radio exclusively on Horrorbid. Think he'll come back. We're gonna end the show on one of I don't I can never make a top interview list because it's really tough for me. But I remember this one in particular at the time I was this was the first time besides going back to August 13th, 2010 where Alex lined up three Friday 13th alum guests, and that was the first ever time interviewing him. But this was the first time since that where I was really, really nervous. I mean, extremely nervous. Because I got to talk to Rick Rosenthal. And this was a really special interview, because Rick's doing this interview while going up to the Aspen Film Fest, and he takes an hour out of his time to do it. And it was... I, I think I had maybe 20 or 30 questions lined up. It was That's another thing. I hardly ever do that, but that was one where I was like, I have to hit on this, I have to hit on that. Uh, I have to get as much Halloween 2 news as I can because 
prior to this, there was no commentary the Halloween 2. It was going to be kind of close as I could get. But what it really turned out to be was a kind of look at who Rick Rosenthal is. He's not just the director of Halloween 2 and Resurrection. And you'll also find there's no Resurrection talk on this. Kind of, It doesn't really dodge it, but it's just, you know, he doesn't want to talk about it. And I don't blame him. But still, definitely... Anytime I think of this interview, I think about what a great time it was and how excited and nervous I was and just the opportunity um, at the time that Mike was able to land him for for me to get an hour with Rick Rosenthal. So here it is. This is from January of 2011 that was on Harbid, the Rick Rosenthal interview. Vincent Paul, you're listening to a special edition of Rabbit and Red Radio, and I'm here with uh, the guy who I, from the age of 6 to 14, I watched Halloween 2 over 100 times, and I still turned out sane, and I'm pleasured to welcome onto the show Mr. Rick Rosenthal, everybody. Glad to be here. Thank you. And thank you for taking time out of out of your busy day. I know you're headed to uh, you're headed to Sundance right now. Yeah, we're we're driving to Sundance. Uh, one of the things I do in addition to uh, directing is I've been over the last seven years producing first time directors and uh, supporting filmmakers trying to break into the business. And the first film we did was a film called Mean Creek uh, in 2004. It landed in Sundance. And uh, now we're back uh, this year with another film, a first-time director, and uh, a film called On the Ice. And uh, one of the nice things is that uh, Jacob Estes, who directed Mean Creek, is back this year at Sundance with his next film called The Detail. So it's, uh, we're, we're driving there. We've got a big crew that's uh, coming along. And uh, occasionally what you'll hear is the rattling of... Uh, rope on the top of the roof not a good not a very good rigging job but uh <laughs> well now going to sundance um you, you have work to promote there but are there any films at sundance that you're looking forward to seeing I'm looking forward to seeing in sundance it's um yes it's a little overwhelming choice the number of films and uh we were a little slow to jump on and try to get tickets and and uh we, you know, we have to get to a few films, but uh, uh, there's a there's a whole strategy to playing Sundance, which uh, you know it's only my second time back there, so I'm not as artful a player as uh, others. You know, I think that the trick to Sundance is if you, once you know you're going is to get tickets to a lot of stuff right away, and uh, you know it's um it's a it's a tremendous community there and it's also a great locale so we'll sort of do a little fun in the snow and see as many movies as we can and, and uh, you know and you, and you run into a lot of people that you haven't seen for a couple of years that, that part that's kind of nice well I'm sure it's nice for you too I mean you're taking on these younger directors you have to get a kick out of that because years ago you were, you were just starting out and so it's kind of like it's going full, full circle for you. Uh, and, and one of the things I always felt I missed was having a real mentor. And I think that okay. uh, I think there's some things I would have done differently, you know, had somebody said, uh, you know, at the right time, I'd advise me, yeah, maybe you want to think about this or maybe you don't want to do that. And uh, I think mentorship is a, it's not a lost art, but in America, I think it's really not given the kind of focus. Uh, that, you know, in, in Europe, kind of mentorship, uh, there was sort of a handing down of, of uh, the crafts. And in uh, America, which is, you know, more of a go-go kind of uh, economic society, um, people are not as as quick to offer a hand up or to offer, a, you know, mentorship. So I, I'm a big believer in it. And, uh, you know, I'm still looking for a mentor at my age as well. So... Anyone out there that's uh, you know ready to mentor, uh, uh, you know, a, a filmmaker with uh, a little shaky knees, that'd be good. I think you've had more than a successful career, in my humble opinion. And you know, look at look. I mean, you graduated from Harvard, and then you go on to the American Film Institute. A lot of people graduating from Harvard, for the most part, they're set for life. They're they're like okay, but you go on to American Film Institute, you do two short films. You did a dark, dark comedy called Moonfaced. 
then another one called the Toyer, right. which literally turned into a, wa- a role for you to direct Halloween 2, and that later turned into Bad Boys, this movie. Yeah. So I, um, I wanted to... I wanted, yeah, I'm sorry. So, uh, you know, luck, ha- luck has a lot to do with it. Uh, I was in an acting class, not not to be an actor, but, you know, I felt that I, I come from documentary filmmaking, and I didn't know a lot about acting, and why is it AFI? I just thought, you know, here's a here's a big area of weakness. So I started to study acting with uh, first with a guy named Charles Conrad, and then later with a guy named Milton Kinsellis, who was very influential in my life uh, uh, in terms of attitude, and uh, he's just a very bright, interesting, supportive guy. Um, and while I was in Milton's class, I saw a, 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 sh- a scene that I thought was riveting, and I found out later it was from, a, at that time, a one-act play called The Poyer, and by uh, a, a, an actor-turned-writer named Gardner McKay, who had been a big star in Hollywood in a television series in the 50s called Avengers of Paradise. Anyway, I, I got the rights to make a short film based on that play, and um, one of the actors in the piece came from the acting class I was in, and, uh, you know, it was it was circumstance. It was just things happened. Uh, I had just come back from, from writing a script in Toronto. I had a tiny bit of money, and I had a bunch of friends who were interested in making a short film, and, and we shot it over a course of uh, three weekends in um you know, it was, a, it was a very interesting psychological thriller, uh, not a horror film per se, um, but very scary. And um, my agent at the time said, you know, uh, I, you know, I, I represent John Carpenter, and I think that uh, with this piece of film, uh, you know, that John's getting offered all these films. This is right after Halloween, and, and uh, he can't possibly do all, all of the films he's being offered, but, there, you know, maybe there's a way to parlay that, and little did we know that really about three months after that conversation, um, the slot for directing Halloween 2 opened up, and uh, I was able, you know, very fortunate that somebody was willing to take a chance on me after a 20-minute film. Oh, that's a huge opportunity, and now, the obvious question I have to ask is, did you, you you've, I'm taking it, you've probably seen Halloween before uh, going on to direct 2, because it seemed like that movie was, it just blew up everywhere. It was one of its kind for its for its time. Yeah. Were you a fan of the original Halloween? Well, uh, the irony is that uh, one of the reasons I, I wasn't a fan of the film, but one of the reasons I had seen it uh, a number of times was the fact that there was a young woman in the opening scene of Halloween uh, whom I was yes. dating and who I uh, eventually, after Halloween 2, uh, married. So there was sort of a double a double-edged attraction to the movie. Uh, when I when I got the assignment, you know, what I wanted to do, I very much wanted to honor uh, Halloween with Halloween, too, in the sense that I really wanted you to feel like, uh, if possible, that Halloween 2, uh, the Halloween end, uh, 1 ended and Halloween 2 started, and you almost couldn't tell that the first film had stopped. The style was the same. The camera kind of movement was the same. And, uh, you know, I try, I try very much to uh, not copy John's style, but to, to honor it and emulate it and build on it. Yeah, and, that, and there's the interesting thing. For the past, the film's been out now almost, we're going on 30 years of Halloween 2, and it seems there are two different versions of the film. We have your version, but then we have almost what, what was cut in the theatrical version is like John Carpenter's version. What I mean by that is it seemed to me he John Carpenter was brought in at one point to film gory scenes because there was a pressure of the industry at the time that all these other horror films, which were inspired by Halloween, weren't really gory, and it seemed that Theo Loretta's from Universal wanted the film to be a little more gory. What what are your thoughts on that? Well, how did you feel at the time knowing that John Carpenter is coming in here to do some reshoots on on your film? Well, you know, I mean, it was it was my film, but it was also his film. And, yeah. You know, I I had sort of been hired with an assignment I felt, which was to stay in the in the style of the first one. And the, you know, the first one is very scary, but it's not particularly bloody. 
very clever. Exactly. And, um, you know, and I wanted my, my idea, and, and it was vetted early on, was to, to keep the film very suspenseful, to have it, uh, to have shocks turn out to be false scares, to, you know, there's always the scare with the cat, and there's a, there's a scene uh, where uh, one of the nurses goes into a room and, and it's dark and, you know, she can't see who's buzz, the buzzer and suddenly an arm grabs her and it's, it's Bud, the ambulance driver boyfriend. You know, things like that that were, you know, that sort of uh, played within the genre, but the, the genre changed while we were making the movie. And, uh, you know, I think the feeling was that in order to compete in the market, where the film was competing, it needed to be uh, a little edgier, a little, a little uh, harder. Uh, there needed to be more shocks. It needed to be a little funny. And um, you know, the, the, the funny thing about the movie business is, is you never know because uh, they could have released uh, the film the way I had shot it, and it might have caught the humor, might have played better than the horror, but. Um, you know, one of the things about making movies is unless you control all aspects of it, the financing and the distribution as well as the actual production of it, you have to make compromises. And there are always other people who, you know, have uh, decision, final decision-making powers. And, and uh, it's, it's also a collaborative art. You know, um, when I, uh, I, I had a very roundabout way to filmmaking. I started out, uh, I went to, Harvard, and I was in a major in political science, and I worked for a senator in Washington, and, you know, I was pretty sure that that's where I was headed, and uh, yeah. one summer, I, I was a pretty serious tennis player, I've been ranked in the East, and I, uh, I was teaching tennis at Monte Carlo, which is a pretty amazing job for a 19-year-old kid. Um, oh, yeah. And uh, I had a couple of big wins, I beat the number two Davis Cup from Monaco, and, you know, I was feeling pretty good about tennis, but... Uh, I was working for a guy who had been a Davis Cup coach, and he said, look, you got to drop out of college and play on the clay court circuit. You're like a year away from being a really good tennis player. I said, well, you know, there's, there's a whole problem with that. There's two problems. Actually, I want to be on the phone when you tell my dad you convinced me to drop out of college. And then, second, I, I want to be on the phone when you explain to the draft board why it's okay that I still keep a 2S deferment. So that didn't happen. Uh, I didn't drop out of school to pursue a tennis career. But what did happen was at the end of that summer in Europe, I, I hitchhiked around and I spent uh, a lot of time looking at art that I'd only seen photos of. You know, I, I, I went to the Picasso Museum in, in Toronto, Japan, and, and I saw Picassos in person, and I saw Giacometti in person. And um, it was a, you know, it was a pretty uh, transcendental experience. And, I was hitchhiking uh, from from Italy back up to Paris, and I got stuck one day in a two days actually in a shipbuilding port in the town called Via Reggio, and uh, I just spent full days wandering among these uh, big steel hulls that were being riveted and welded together, and, and they looked like upside down Calder staples, and um, I. I was really struck by the welding process. It just seemed magical. You know, it took two pieces of metal and joined them together with wire. It was very primal in a, in a lot of ways. And I came back to college and decided, you know, I really wanted to explore the art world only to find that Harvard had no art department. They had a history of art, but they had no studio art. Uh, but the, what they did allow you to do as an undergrad was to take one course per semester anywhere in the Boston area at an accredited college or university. So I went down the street and I took a welding course at MIT. I don't know what it's called. You know, it was Welding 101, but it had been dubbed Welding for Poets, kind of tongue-in-cheek. And I learned how to okay. weld. And uh, it, just, it just catapulted me into the world of making art. And the uh, Ironically, metal sculpture and, and filmmaking, I, I think, are very similar. You know, they're both visual mediums, but whereas uh, metal sculpture is three dimensions uh, in, in space, film is three dimensions because it's got the element of time. And uh, 
so he, the only major that sort of allowed me any kind of sort of creative field was something called visual and environmental studies. It was basically a pre-architecture part uh, of nature. But, you know, it gave me a chance to play uh, with photography and film and video at an early time. And um, that's, you know, that's really how I got into filmmaking. And with all – with I noticed with uh, – for one, you know, bring up Holly too here, that you use some of that background on uh, sort of in a visual sense with that movie. Uh, off the top of my head, I forget which one. I know it was a German uh, – I know you use – in a lot of your films, you kind of use all, your background and your love of art into your movies. It, for you, that has to be a, a, a slam dunk. It's just you're, you're still using everything you've learned into a kind of a new format, if you will. Yeah, and you, and you're learning how to communicate ideas. Um, you know, you're not lighting the set yourself because that's no longer your job. Uh, when you when you begin to work in feature films, you know you have to you have to collaborate with people, but you have to learn how to articulate. You know what the look of a set should be, or uh, how you want something lit. Um, I did a I did a pilot recently in in. Uh, Canada and and uh, you know the supposed to be a very futuristic set and it was not a good set. I mean, it looked very much like junior high school with stars and rocket ships on the on the great walls. You know, it was it, was, it just didn't work. Um, and I probably was not as gentle in expressing why I didn't think it worked. But you know, you 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 do have to learn also not only how to communicate elaborate, but also how to get the best out of people. And uh, that's, you know, that's an art that you, one, or I'll just speak for myself, I continue to, you know, evolve and uh, hopefully hopefully for the better and learn how to collaborate a little better and, and encourage people to to uh, bring, bring their best. Well, before I get on to, you know, your other projects, there's two burning questions that not only myself, but other people, and I'm sure, you know, I try to find out so much stuff. This whole, you don't, I, I don't know if you're from, if you know this, this, or you know of this, but there is like a huge outcry about your Halloween too, about why there isn't a special edition, why there hasn't been any commentary done. And are you, do you know, have you heard anything about that? Uh, that, oh, that I know, fans I know ever, that you know, it's a I know it's a disappointment to, to Halloween fans that there hasn't been a special edition. I, I have no idea why there hasn't been. Um, I did a special edition for Bad Boys. It was great fun. And the guy who, uh, you know, ironically, the guy who was the uh, commentator on that edition was the editor of, um, of uh, Halloween Resurrection. So, so it was really fun for me because it was somebody who was asking me questions that I knew really well and I had just worked with. And, and it was yeah. and it was fun to talk about the film, and it would be fun to talk about Halloween, too. Uh, you know, I don't know if people are concerned about, you know, is there uh, ill will on my part or on John's part. Um, I don't I don't have any. I mean, it's, you know, that's also part of the evolution of, of working, too, that each time you go, go to bat, um, hopefully you have a little bit more uh, influence on the final version of the film, but um, it's very you know it's very hard to have final cut on a movie. What what scenes for for that movie were never shown? Were just cut? How many how many how many scenes never made it to the uh, theatrical version? There was there is a um, the last shot of the film as it exists now. Uh, Jamie Lee is in the back of uh, the ambulance. Yeah, and there's a close-up on her face, and, and, and it ends on her face. One more frame, and the shape sits up behind her, and she screams. And it turns out it's uh, Lance, the young uh, intern at the at the hospital, who had fallen and been knocked out uh, in the operating room. Um, and, and, you know, that was just, uh, it was something that amused, I thought it was funny, I thought, I thought it was one organic, one more organic uh, twist, but um, it just didn't, it just didn't survive, you know. Um, it was interesting to, 
it was interesting to see the film uh, tested in uh, in uh, North Las Vegas and uh, the the response, things that uh, audiences took really seriously when when Jamie's being chased in the basement of the hospital and she's trying to crawl out a very small window and her feet are kind of exposed and he's slashing very close to her feet and the the kind of uh, response to audiences they're really involved and they're really talking and uh, you know that that's what horror films do well, it's great, though. At least you can see these TV cuts now. They, they show those scenes. And you have to, if you ever get a chance, watch AMC's version. They chop your film up. It's so ridiculously bad how they, they put, like, 15 minutes into the film as the beginning. And it's just, it's skewed. It's, we, we call it the, uh, the uncut TV cut, the unofficial. Right. Well, I guess, you know, I guess that, that we're just in a, in, a, in the digital world now where lots of different um, cuts exist because people can do it. You know? you know what I found interesting? You were you're a part of TV history. Directed and you had a co-producing of a great show called Life Goes On. It starred Chris Burke. Nobody at this time who had Down Syndrome ever starred on a TV show. I guess my question is, did you? how did you approach working with Chris Burke? Did you, did you try to keep in mind, okay... You know, he has Down syndrome, or did you just view him as a person and an actor and had that go secondary? How does a director handle that? I think I think it's a holistic approach. I mean, you can't forget that he has Down syndrome, but yeah. you you also are trying to encourage what his potential is, and he had he had incredible potential. I mean, he was a fairly charming kid, and you know, there were there were times where you would have a little bit of a meltdown, and not unlike any actor, by the way, but. Sometimes the words would just sort of disappear a little. And, um, you know, I had a feeling that, that exercise would help him and uh, nutrition would help him as well. But, I mean, that didn't solve the – that was a, a long-range program uh, on a moment-to-moment basis. You know, there would be times where you just had to be really patient. Yeah. And what was, what was interesting about Chris was he, in my working with him, he never failed to come through. He always came through. Sometimes it took a little while. Um, we were in, uh, somehow I convinced Warner's uh, television that the second season should start in Hawaii. I'm still not sure how I ever did that. But uh, we convinced them that the, the Thatcher family goes on uh, on a vacation in Hawaii. We shot two episodes in Hawaii. And uh, we got over there, and, and part of it was that the dad wanted to sing Tiny Bubbles with Don Ho. And we were able to get Don Ho, and we were able to, stage the scene in which he comes up onto the stage and sings Tiny Bubbles with Don Ho. And there was a lot of wonderful stuff. And there's a scene with Don Ho after their show where uh, the whole family is saying is thanking him and saying goodbye. And he has a scene with Chris Burke. And uh, Corky just, um, Chris just had a really, it was late at night and you know, he was tired and he just had a little momentary, not even a meltdown. It was just like it was clear that it was going to take about another hour to get the scene. And that would be an hour of overtime. And, you know, I had to go to the Warner's uh, executive and say, what do you want to do here? And he was like, what do you mean? And I said, well, you know, I'm pretty sure we're going to get the scene, but uh, it's going to take an hour of overtime. And if we shut down now and, and we don't pay overtime, we won't get the scene. And after all, you know, we came here to Hawaii, and it's Don O, and it's a scene with Don and all that. So I think we should get it. And he, and he was well, but if it's, you know, is it really an hour? Which was a fair question because, you know, directors like to say, oh, yeah, it's only an hour, and then several hours later it's trouble. But um, uh, anyway, we definitely we got the scene. Now, um, I have to pause for one second, I think, because my uh, cohort, Nick Morton, is uh, – I've just pulled up to his house, and he's about to put his stuff – it's going up on the roof. Okay. He's about to put his stuff into, uh, into the car. So um, – is there a way to pause for a second, or... Yeah, yeah. All right, we're going to take a quick break here. We'll be right back with Rick Rosenthal after this. Your least favorite horror show will be right... Should live. 
woman lived here before you was nuts. Wouldn't be surprised if someone just got fed up and off her. She was my aunt. Heart of gold, though. Roger Cobb has come here alone. Daddy? <laughs> but no one is ever alone in the house. This house knows everything about you. Leave while you can. No! It has been waiting for him. Hi. Sandy. Now. It wants you. Horror has found a new home. House. Enter at your own risk. Check out Crystal Lake After Dark. Proboards.com. The very best in Friday the 13th discussion since August 13th, 2004. Hi, I'm Rick Rosenthal, and you're listening to Vince and Paul and Rabbit Red Radio. Michael, where do you live? Hardin Field. And uh, what do your hobbies include? Killing people. What do you do for fun? Kill people. When you go on a date, what do you look forward to? With the rewrites. It just didn't bear any resemblance to um, the version that I had done, and, and there are a lot of you know there are a lot of instances. I mean, we had the director dropped out. I was a last minute replacement, and um, I had sort of said, "I'm I just I'm not really interested in the script the way it is, but here's what I would pitch to you guys if I were going to come on." And I pitched it, and they they agreed to um, to go that way, and the script was rewritten, and then. Just before we started, suddenly the producers decided to go back to the old script. And that Birds so, 2 script was – you. when you looked at that, what was your first thought? Did you think it was a joke? Because it, it seemed – because for any director to change his name on the, on the directing credit, it has to be – you have to know it's not going to be good. Well, no, I, you don't change it when you start. I mean, you don't go into something saying, oh, I'm change, I'll am i do this, but I'm changing my name. You go into something saying, well, you know, I, th- I think this could be an interesting project, but um, certain things have to happen. And, and, and they looked like they were going to. Everything looked like it was going to be really good. And, in fact, at one point, there was a character in the rewrite that was going to be played by Kelly Martin. From life goes on. That was sort of one of the one of the agreements. It's one of the reasons why I was willing to do it. Was it was a great part for Kelly, and you know, I really like working with her. And, and uh, coincidentally, I worked with her last spring after 20 years uh, of not working with her. You know, it was it was amazing to work with her again. She's just an extraordinarily good actress and really really fun to work with. Um, so. Uh, you know, you, you go into a project and you think everything's fine, and, you know, in the course of it, sometimes it just doesn't work out. I don't think anyone goes in uh, purposely trying to make a bad project, you know. It's yeah. just a difference of opinion, and, and things happen, and um, next thing you know, it's just not what you thought it was going to be. You know, I wanted to bounce back to, to Life Goes On. with You uh, You were a co-producer on that, on the series. I was actually... I was actually an executive producer, and I, I sort of co-ran the show with my partner, Michael Braverman, on that. He, he handled uh, all the, the writing. The, the, he, was, he handled the, the scripts, and the, I sort of handled the, choosing the directors and, and uh, all of the post-production on it, all the editing and stuff like that. And how many how many years did you stay on there for? What was it up until ninety one? After that, uh... I was on I was on for the first two years, and then um, it's interesting. An editor that I had hired said to me one day, she said, "You know, I really think you should move on." And I said, "Why?" And she said, "Because you, you know, you're not gonna you can stay on the show and have a really good time, but you're not gonna grow. You're doing exactly now what you're gonna be doing in two years." 
going to be the same. And you're not going to have changed or grown, move forward as an artist. And I thought that was a really interesting point. She was a no-nonsense, really good editor and uh, uh, really bright. And I thought that was um, an interesting, very interesting point. Do you look back on that now? Do you have any regrets about that decision? The show went on for another, what was it, two more seasons? They had four seasons. Three years, yeah. yeah. You know, the, the show changed pretty much after the second year. And, it, uh, you know, I like the show. That uh, Our concept when I was on it was that each week it would be a show about this family, but, boy, you would never know what was going to happen. And, you know, there would be all sorts of different uh, kinds of shows that we would expose you to. And, you know, there's a rock and roll show. And, uh, uh, there were all sorts of fantasies. There's a, there's a, my favorite show, last show I directed there, uh, was called Corky's Travels. And uh, Corky uh, had some, you know, Corky had some tickets to see a show in Chicago. And he gets on the, gets on the uh, bus. And just as he gets on the bus and his older sister's going to meet him, uh, her, her car breaks down and she is unable to meet the bus. And all on the bus, he meets this troubadour named, uh, you know, who's, who's uh, played by Leon Redbone, who was, who was fatter. And, you know, there's six original songs in an hour. It was, it was kind of unheard of. And it was a great, it was just, you know, it was just so much fun to do something like that. And uh, the, the network was incredibly supportive. ABC was incredibly supportive. And, uh, you know, there were times I, I sort of got called the principal's office a couple of times uh, down at ABC. But um, one time was early in the first year we did a show where the older sister talked directly to the camera. I recall breaking the fourth wall. And, yeah. uh, uh, you know, uh, Rick... Uh, Bob Iger wants to see you right away, so I drive to Entry City and ABC, and you know I go into the office, and he and, and his two um, sort of immediate cohorts were there, and they said, "Rick, you broke the fourth wall." And I, and you know, I was sort of a wise ass, and I said, "Well, you know, it's interesting. Uh, on the way over here, you know, I thought he might be upset about something, so I read through the producer's handbook, and you know, it's so interesting. Nowhere in the producer's handbook does it say anything about." the fact that you can't break the fourth wall. <laughs> They're like, oh, that's really funny, Rick. And I'm going, you know, guys, when we agreed to do the show, you told us, you know, you wanted us to do a show that was fresh and original, and, and you would kind of let us do our thing as long as we came in second, because we were never going to beat 60 minutes. That was our time spot yeah. on Sunday night. I said, and that's what we've done. And, you know, I don't think that breaking the fourth wall is a huge deal, you know. It's an MTV audience, guys. And, you know, we won them over. They were sort of grudgingly. I mean, they were sort of the thing that was great about the group that was there when I was there is that they were they were bemused by us. They, I think, they liked the fact that we wanted to take some chances and we wanted to push the envelope, and and they were really supportive, and uh, sometimes far more supportive than um, than the studio we were working for. So, who who still remains sort of you know at the time that. We were doing Life Goes On. They were also doing China Beach and a show called The Flash. And, you know, we weren't we weren't a hot, sexy show. We were just really good quality entertainment. And that resonated, I think, more with the network uh, than it did uh, at the time with the, with the uh, with Warner's television, with the studio we were working for. And, you know, I, I said it before, and I, I mean it. I still think that show was well ahead of its time because it, the writing on the show was nothing – you've ever seen before on television and when you say you know walking away from it and that's amazing that a lot of people would would try to stay with with the show and just you know you got a steady paycheck and i guess it just shows how you are as a person you're willing to take a risk well you know here's i, I mean that's the good news and the bad news when i did um when i did bad boys um you know after after the film was released, I got offered a lot, a lot of movies, uh, but they were all kind of in the same vein. They were edgy and dark and um, action oriented and all of that. And I ended up making, going to Paris and making a, a romantic comedy called American Dreamer with Joe Beth Williams and Tom Conti and Giancarlo Giannini. 
and I had a phenomenal time, and I, I loved working with the producer I worked with. Um, but it was a it was a radical departure from what I had done before. And you know, we were talking at the beginning of the show a little bit about mentors. You know, I think if I had a had a mentor, I don't think anyone would have advised me to do a romantic comedy on the heels of of a Bad Boys. The reason would have been not that it, that it wasn't fun to sort of spread my wings and try new things. It was because it confused the town, and they thought, you know, wait a minute, this can't be the same guy who just did this dark, edgy movie with Sean Penn. Yeah. Um, you know, I had a great time doing it, and I really liked the movie. I mean, uh, ironically, um, there's a whole there's a whole group of people who saw American Dreamer when it came out, and, and they are diehard Rabbit fans. And they they really love the movie. If you're you're one, I mean, every now and then when I'm feeling uh, pretty discouraged about life, I just go on uh, Amazon.com and read the uh, or IMDb and read the comments from fans of American Dreamer. And you know, it's a movie that it's a light romantic comedy, but a lot of people, you know, for a lot of people, it really touched them in in, uh, in meaningful ways. So. That, that was kind of fun, too. You know, it's interesting um, you say that. You go on, you read people's comments, makes you feel good. I was going to ask you that. You ever you ever come, come across comments where you, you people rip apart a movie? I don't know if that, I'm sure it's happened to you with, with Halloween Resurrection. That people probably... Because it seems like a lot of fans just, for some reason, another they didn't like the movie. I, now, I always say well, they're wrong. The thing, because, I'm sorry. The thing about, the thing about reviews is if you, if you read the good ones, you... You can read the bad ones. If you believe the good ones, you got to believe the bad ones, and vice versa. But you know, I mean, a lot of stuff is out of context. I, I remember getting, reading a really, really, really bad review of uh, a film like you called *This Is Thunder* of Vietnam vets, and uh, I actually called the I called the reviewer in Seattle, and uh, you know, he just thoroughly trashed me and every film I'd ever made. And I said, "You know, did did you really uh, have you seen all these films that, that you trashed, or did you just?" trash them on spec and uh, he was like oh no i saw them all and they were just terrible i don't know how you managed to stay uh, working at the director so you know it was not it was not a terribly satisfying conclusion uh so you gotta be careful about taking on the critics you know because you know you can't people are entitled to their opinion you yeah can't make them like the movie. Now, you might think they're wrong but in the end you know somebody says that ah, i just don't you know you how you keep directing? Yeah, but but Rick, let's let's be honest. Aren't aren't most film critics just failed directors to begin with, and they're just bitter and angry? I don't I don't think that's true. You read, I mean, you read Pauline Kael; she's really intelligent. You read uh, Siskel and Ebert. Uh, well, I haven't really liked that boy, so I guess. Really <laughs> nice, but but uh, you know, I mean, it, when you read criticism, it's interesting to me. I mean, I'm fascinated because I'm interested. You know, I yeah. mean, I think you learn. Uh, when you when you read criticism, if it's just vitriolic and bitter, then there's not going to be a lot of insight. But you know, if somebody takes you to task because you set up a character and you didn't pay him off, or uh, in the end, you know, there's something missing. The cathartic moment never happens, or something like that. You know, there are times where you look at it and you go, "Well, you know, I got sucked into um, making this movie." You know, the thing is, as long as you think there's still a movie. Uh, in your future, you're not done. It's not over. You made your last movie. So the idea is that you keep getting better. And, uh, you know, that also flies a little bit in the face of, you know, ageism and, and the idea that you're over the hill at 35 or you're over the hill at 40 or, my God, you're over the hill at 50. I don't necessarily think that's true. I think you're over the hill when you stop being interested in making movies that are better than the movies you made before. Well, uh, was there ever a product, project during that time after Bad Boys that you turned down that you sort of regret? Anything that uh, people would know that you were offered but turned it down? Well, there were movies I went on meetings where, or there's actually one movie I went, I didn't go on in a meeting because my agent at the time said, look, if you're going to go on this meeting, you have to be willing to shoot the script exactly the way it is. And I read the script, and there's a lot of good, but there was some stuff I didn't think was very good, and so I didn't go on the meeting, and later I heard the guy who went on the meeting said, oh, I love the script, and got the movie, and then, you know, I had it re completely rewritten, so, yeah, there's times where you go, oh, man, that was that was foolish, and you learned a little bit 
Like, honesty is not always the best policy. Well, but, sometimes, sometimes, sometimes you need to be enthusiastic and, um, and, and use that enthusiasm to get the job. And then, you know, once you become a guy, people are more likely to, um, to listen. You know, I, I tell you a funny story. I was, um, when I was hired on the first job I ever had, my first really professional job, I was uh, hired to rewrite a script in Toronto. And uh, I went up to Toronto right after Christmas, and uh, I had uh, the script I had, the draft I had read was okay. When I arrived the day after Christmas, they gave me a previous draft, which I thought was great. So I said the next day to the producer, why am I here? And he said, what do you mean? I said, well, the second draft is really, really good. He said, yeah, it's pretty good, but, you know, we want you to take the third draft and write a fourth draft, but make it more like the second draft. I said, well, that's kind of weird. Why don't I just start with the second draft? No, uh, we kind of want to work with the third draft. So whatever. Anyway, so I, I did a, a draft in 17 days, and they were really happy, and they were like, God, that's great. We want you to do one more draft. And I said, well, I'd like to change hotels. They, they said, what do you mean? I said, well, I, just, I don't really like the hotel I'm in. I just, you know, I just don't, I don't like the hotel. Well, we can't possibly change hotels. Well, why not? Well, you know, we have a special deal there, and it would cost like five bucks more a night or something. And I thought, you know, I should really, I really should say I'm sorry, but I can't, I can't do this. But I didn't, you know. You know, and and I did another draft, and then they fired me, and they rehired the writer before me, and then they fired him again. Yay! But I'm convinced to this day that if I had made them switch hotels, they wouldn't have fired me because they would have felt, oh, we can't fire him. We're we're paying all this money for his hotel. So you learned something from that. I'm I'm taking it. Yeah, always <laughs> always get the best hotel you can. Exactly. Oh, it, 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 when people pay a certain when when they sort of feel like when they feel like they've hired someone who is worth their hiring, they don't like to fire them. When they hire when they hired you as a bargain or something, they're you're you're a bargain, you know. When, that's why you see all these scripts. It's interesting, you know, these the script doctors in Hollywood who are paid just huge sums of money, and I don't think they're necessarily. <laughs> I don't think the rewrites that they <laughs> that they come up with are necessarily better than a writer who might be more and more enthusiastic and, and more and e- more eager, but. They stand behind these writers. Why? Well, because they paid them a hundred thousand dollars a week, and the guys work for three weeks or whatever. You know, and, well, not so quick to throw that script out. Yeah. But if that, but if that draft had been written by a first-time writer that they had paid, you know, twenty-five thousand dollars for, they they'd be very quick to jettison the script, and, and the quality of the script might be exactly the same. But the perception. So I guess my point, very long-winded point, I guess, but is that Hollywood is so much about perception. And if you're perceived to be the guy or the director or the producer or whatever, um, there's, a, there's, a, there's a tendency for executives to listen to you more than if you've been plucked and uh, up as a kind of as a bargain or, well, let's take a chance, but we don't know. You know, so, Rick, do you think nowadays with, I mean, you started, you started with filmmaking back in the 70s. Do you think with nowadays it's almost it's easier for anybody to to just direct a film with all the technology advancements? All you, it, I'm not talking whether or not to make a good film because really, if you have three thousand dollars, you get the right computer, you get the right camera, you can get a really nice film put together visual wise. Do you think that's more of yeah. an advantage of today's standards that more people are can actually make a film, or do you think that's a disadvantage? Yeah. I think there are I think there are far more films being made today, and they're ma- and they're being made in all sorts of styles. And I think that uh, audiences are much more accepting of all different styles because they because they've really grown up now on a, a, they're a culture of the internet, a culture of MTV, and they're a culture of uh, a certain kind of visualization of ideas. But there's there's not as much. Story development and character development and uh, dramatic structural development, as as there was when uh, it was harder to make films, and so you needed to get 
uh, you need to jump through more hoops with your project before you were before you were able. You know, uh, when I was at the American Film Institute, the film that I made there is in the, in the thesis film, and, and it continues because I've also taught there. Um, there's a tremendous amount of development that goes into uh, projects before they're filmed as thesis projects. And so, um, you know, that's within a, stru a structural program, structured program. The, the fact is, is, as you just said, you know, access to cameras and editing equipment is so ubiquitous that it's much, it's much, much, much easier now for anybody to pick up a camera and over the course of a couple of days generate material, which is then edited. There's also, uh, I don't think the acting is, you know, one of the things in student movies um, generally fall on is the quality of the acting is not that strong. So and that's because the quality of the actors who are willing to do student films is as high as professional actors, but it, it's because of young filmmakers haven't yet learned how to talk to actors and elicit performances and all of that. I said two more questions. That was well put, by the way. I mean, because I'm trying to think, like, if I was you and you look back when you started how tough it is to make a movie, but there's a difference between just making a movie and making a great film. And that's what, you know, with technology advances. The one question I have is, this is the, I have to do the nerd question to all the horror fans. Um, any great Donald Pleasant stories on the uh, set of Halloween 2? Donald Pleasant Oh, you know, um, I I really like working with him. He I didn't get to know him that well. You know, he he wasn't a guy that hung out a lot, and there's there's a lot of him, but there you know, in some ways there's a lot of him, and in other ways there isn't. I mean, Donald knew his character really well by then. Um, you know, I think there you have to be careful as a director not to overdirect when somebody knows what they're doing. Yeah, you know, you don't need to put your put your two cents in. Because it's a delicate balance. It's one of the things that I've had a hard time or harder time in television where there are so many now, there's so many writer-producers who want to give you notes of before, after, and during uh, a performance. And, you know, you try to explain to producers that they might have a good note, but that note might cost them the entire performance of a scene. And, and they look at you, you know, kind of blankly, and, and you try to explain that sometimes... The fact that uh, actors say is pronouncing a word is, is important, but it's not as important uh, as changing his or her performance. And it isn't so much that the word is going to get changed, it's the focus or the concentration is going to get broken, and it's going gonna, it's gonna to alter the way the scene is being done. So if you like the scene, be careful about fixing it. And uh, you know, I just think that when you work with really good actors, you got to be careful about over-directing. I, I was at a, a film recently where the actress was asked, it was a phenomenal performance, was asked, how did the director work with you? And she said, you know, mostly he didn't say much, he just held my hand between takes. That was pretty great. Well, you know, with with what you're doing today, you're you have your own production company. Well, you're out. You're you're doing what what you said you needed, what you you wish you had years ago, which was a mentor. And you're being a mentor to, to young directors, and I think that's amazing. Now it can come full circle like that, and I think everybody's would be lucky just to have you kind of lead them, teach them what to do. Can you tell everybody what well, what you've been working on for the uh, past couple of years? Um, you know, I I continue to look for a film that. Uh, I want to direct, and I've, I've found a couple of stories that we're developing into screenplays. And uh, there's one script that I really like a lot that we thought we were going to get off the ground this year. And uh, the, the final climactic scene takes place on a frozen lake. And uh, we, have, we have plans to shoot it in Michigan, uh, not just because of the tax incentives, but because actually it's written for Michigan. It's a story about, it's a, it's a crime genre story. And, it's, it's about a guy whose father was head of the crime family in, in Detroit and who's uh, been betrayed by a, a lieutenant and has gone to prison and in prison is murdered. And the lieutenant has disappeared into the federal witness program. And uh, our story picks up as his, as, as, as our protagonist 
is the son of the murdered crime boss family. And um, he, the story is about his trying to hunt down the man responsible for his, for his father going to prison. Anyway, the, the film is set in Detroit in the Upper Peninsula, and we, we've gone and scouted the Upper Peninsula. We, and we've um, pretty much are, are set to go in Detroit, and, we're, and we've been we spent the last few months trying to cast the film and just haven't been able to cast it yet. And uh, we're running out. We're we're pretty much out of time in terms of being able to get the film mounted and uh, get the final climactic scene shot on a frozen lake. Because by the time we're shooting, it's likely to be April and April or May. And so we we postponed that for a year, and we're going to work really hard to pull it together for next year. And uh, in the interim, there's a there's a, a kind of a genre, a thriller genre that we're trying to pull together to shoot in the late spring. So that, that's what that's what I'm working on, you know, as a director. And then my company's working on a number of projects where we've uh, we're working with writers and trying to get stories to scripts to come to full fruition. And uh, you know, it's a it's a process. It always takes a little longer than you think. Writers who say, oh yeah. I'll turn this in in two weeks. They generally mean four months. Yeah. And uh, so things don't things don't quite happen as quickly as we'd like them to. But um, we spent a couple of days recently with a uh, an actor who is making a transition to director, and he has a script that we really like. And so he shot uh, a couple of scenes, kind of as a as a little bit of a tryout, uh, as a almost like a, a lab. Uh, and we really liked working with him, and we liked him. Uh, and we liked the work that he did. So that that looks like it's something that may come to uh, come to a head this uh, this spring, spring or summer, as a film that we would produce. And it's another project where uh, a guy I work with who's a, who's a producer, but he has started to direct at my age. He's never directed a feature, and he has a really interesting script that I also we'll be able to pull together and help support. So, you know, we're, we're constantly looking at projects and also trying to find uh, means of, of financing ways of financing films and, and people who are interested in supporting small, what we call micro-budget films, the sort of billion-dollar and under category, which we think is right now a sweet spot. Yeah. Or independent filmmaking. If anybody wanted to send you, say, a screenplay or just a short they made, are they able to send that to you? Is there any place they could? Yeah, we we prefer they send us checks. <laughs> oh, j- just as as a as a good sign of faith. No, we 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 prefer that they're like I'm all about financing. But yes, we we're always looking at at uh, you know if people go to our website, it's uh, www dot whitewaterfilms.com there's uh, information about getting in touch with us and the last thing how'd your hockey game go last night oh I'm so <laughs> glad you asked you know uh, it was it was pretty transcendental or transcendent or one of the one of those words <laughs> uh, I had I had two assists in a 5-3 victory so I like to think that I was uh, integral to the the process there. Well, yeah, the big enforcer. But what was really exciting was I had two uh, passes that broke guys for breakaways, cross ice passes. And uh, in one case, uh, Doug, if you're out there listening, uh, I don't know why you didn't bury the puck, but you did. And that's really disappointing. But uh, for the other guy who just, you know, just got the pass and took off and slid it right between the goalie's legs. That was great. That was great fun. See, that's that's how how do you not like a Rick Rosenthal? Is my question to everybody. I mean, seriously, who who else plays hockey? What directors out there play? I mean, and you're getting into it too. You're still athletic. You could have been a tennis oh, player. I'm, I'm still very, I'm very into it. Um, it's you know, I like to think that hockey is the most fun you can have with your clothes on. <laughs> for for many Canadians, that's a yes and a no. De- depends on what team they're playing for. See, I'm a Flyers fan. What's your What's your favorite NHL team? Well, right now I'm sort of a Penguins fan. I, just, uh, I like uh, Crosby. Ah, uh, he's, a, yeah. he's a pretty boy. Let's face well, I also it. Like, I gotta say, I like Chicago too. I I was in Vancouver 
uh, the day of the, the medal cup, the, the gold medal uh, game between the U.S. and Canada. I didn't go to the game, but uh, tickets were about five thousand dollars a piece. Jeez. But I was uh, the apartment I have up there overlooks the uh, Burrard Bridge, and it, about three fifty nine, I think the Canadians scored their winning goal, and the horn started uh, on the Burrard Bridge, and they did not stop through all of Vancouver. <laughs> Until three o'clock in the morning, it was, a, it was a pretty amazing game. Yeah. Oh no, it was. I, mean, I will cut you slack for being a Penguins fan, and uh, yeah, with Sidney Crosby. I love seeing yeah. Ovechkin take right. him out. Ovechkin can take him out right. any day. Well, you know, Ovechkin's good. There's no doubt about it. Ah, uh, you know, the guy drives 140 in his car. I don't know anymore. I think the Capitals try putting a stop to that. But you've never seen a guy who can fight and can score. It's very rare that ever happens. That's why I'm sold on him. Even as no, I agree. I agree. You know, I um, I never got to skate. You know, I used to skate. Uh, Bruckheimer has a has a uh, tournament in Las Vegas where he invites you know a lot of a lot of uh, industry people, but also a bunch of guys from the NHL. And uh, a few years ago, I went out and Gretzky actually uh, skated, and uh, we just didn't we didn't play him. You know, we didn't, we didn't play his team, but uh, I played against Robitaille. That was kind of fun. I wow. told somebody the other day that Robitaille came down. I was playing D in those days, and Robitaille came down for one on one. Looked at me and thought, you know, I'm gonna just buzz around this guy again. I actually picked the puck, and it's you could see the circuits just completely ground to a stop, and uh, that, that was a pretty big thrill. Last year, uh, we shot the L.A. Kings opening commercial, and Robotite now is uh, you know a part of the Kings personnel, and he was uh, at the during the shoot. I waited till the very end of the shoot. He really liked what we were shooting, and the commercial turned out great. But we, I waited till the very end, and I said so. I got to tell you a story. You probably won't believe it's true, but it is. I said five years ago we were in Vegas in a tournament. Do you remember? He said, yeah, the Brock Hunter tournament. I go, yeah. Well, you came down on me one on one, and I picked you. He went, no way. I went, that is this way. He goes, Rick, I want you to look at you and look at me, and then think. Did you really stop me? I went, yeah. Great, it's true. <laughs> That's. I mean, Robotai was one of the one of the best of the '90s. Oh, easily, hands down. Yeah, he was. He wasn't that. He wasn't that fast, though. I gotta say, he had great hands, but he wasn't. That. He's no Rick Rosenthal on the ice, is what you're saying. Oh, he's probably coming over. Now. He's probably got my number now. Look out for him. Oh, right. uh, Rick, I appreciate your time, and this has been an honor, seriously, to talk to you. Is there anything you want to say to all the fans out there? There's a lot of people who they make they make fan films just based off of Halloween too. By the way, I mean seriously. Oh. Uh, we, we have a, you know, we have a phrase, and, and, and I guess it's an acronym, JKS, and it stands for Just Keep Shooting. So, you know, no matter during the course of a day, it looks like you're behind, or you're not going to make the day, or things are falling apart, just keep shooting. It's very well put, and uh, I will keep bombarding Universal Studios about putting the special edition together. Uh, that's how passionate I am yeah, about I'd love that. Yeah, i That'd be fun to do. So I don't know what the resistance is. You know, I think I think what happened was I don't think anyone sort of got on them before they. It was it was only after the the new that whatever edition came out that there wasn't a commentary that suddenly everybody was like, well, why is there no commentary? Whereas I think if there had been a big movement to get commentary, that might have been different. So you know, listen, if they if they feel that that special edition would satisfy uh, an itch out there, I'm sure they'd scratch it. Well, there definitely is one, and I wish you the best of luck at Sundance. I want you to have a fun time, um, and, and thanks again for just coming on. I mean, you, I hardly see you do any interviews, so this means a lot to me. I feel I feel special, is what I'm saying. Oh, well, good. I, that was great fun, and, and uh, you made the interview very easy, so uh, oh, thank thanks you. a lot. Uh, thank you, Mr. Rosenthal. Good luck, and uh, God bless you, man. You're, you are the best. All right. Thanks a lot. Take care. Bye. <gasps> that was horrible. <gasps> that was horrible. <gasps> that was horrible. <gasps> that was horrible. <gasps> that was horrible.